Good afternoon, and um, uh, thank you uh, for coming. It's not often I have the uh, privilege of uh, speaking in Vilnius at the National Library, and it's great to see the professor, an advisor to two presidents and um, uh, one uh, prime minister in the uh, front uh, row. And my old friend uh, Ritas, as director of communications at the MFA, who also um, uh, moonlights, also has a secondary op uh, occupation as the organiser of successful football tours. <laughs> uh, Elena was, was very generous about my uh, biography, and I will talk about the substantive issues and challenges I uh, face. But um, uh, I had an idea uh, a couple of years ago, and I said to Ritas, I said, look, I run a football club. We're not very good, but they're quite interested in coming to Lithuania because they've heard about Lithuania. They've heard about, you know, 100 years of renewed independence and a 1,000-year history and um, running Poland and all that uh, important stuff. And um, uh, Rita said, we'll sort it. And, and Rita's did sort it. And the Westminster Wanderers brought two teams to uh, Vilnius in the summer of uh, 2018. I am fortunate to have um, one uh, lovely uh, wife and two horrible children. <laughs> And to give my wife um, some respite, I brought the children over here. They were surprised, as they are 12 and 14 years old, that they were allowed to enter and dance in um, Lithuanian discotheques, Lithuanian clubs, at 2 o'clock in the morning. But they quite enjoyed it, sort of liberal uh, Lithuanian approach, um, for which you are famous. But my point in telling you this story is first to formally uh, thank Ritas and colleagues for the hospitality that these um, uh, young men and one uh, young woman, my daughter, experienced when they were in your marvellous um, uh, city. But also because of the public relations and communications exercise, it created 26 advocates for Lithuania. Not a huge number, but if 26 people talk to 26 other people, you can see it multiplies. So there's an important lesson there for all of us to have faith and confidence in our offer. Now, some of you may look at me and think, well, that's clever. He has a big communications um, uh, job. I wonder how he does it, and um, uh, I uh, want to be like him. I would advise you against that, because one of the big lessons I want to transmit to you and share with you about the future of communication is that the communication asset I have found the world over, which we as communicators lack, is not creativity or digital competence or our ability to run campaigns, but it is leadership, the ability to inspire, give confidence and empower our colleagues and teams, the ability to take responsibility for delivering the task or the project to the highest standard, the ability to speak truth to power and to give the best communications advice. This skill is not absent. This skill, I'm sure, is an abundance in this um, uh, room. But for communication to take its proper place in the range of management, business and public service um, uh, tools, we need to practice leadership and need to develop our leadership skills to a high degree. And I thought what Ritas did uh, for us was an act of leadership. So it's a privilege to be here at the National Library um, speaking to the Lithuanian Communications Association. And in terms of uh, leadership, I would um, uh, simply add uh, uh, this. You must lead in your own way and you must be authentic leaders in bringing out the personalities that you each have, the attributes, the learning you have gained and lead in a way that um, uh, suits you. I have a big job uh, now but I got here um, uh, by um, uh, doing a series of, of jobs, not all of which were entirely um, uh, successful. I ran uh, the worst political communications operation in the history of 20th century British politics. I once had to um, uh, rip the head off a chicken, or at least no one seems particularly surprised at that. Um, uh, I once had to rip the head, I should say, off a man dressed as a chicken to stop him uh, uh, gaining access to and being photographed by the then British uh, Prime Minister. 
I've worked for five um, uh, Prime Ministers, including uh, this one, and there have been some successes, some things I'm hugely proud of, and some things I wish I had done differently. But I fundamentally believe that if you are going to lead and be successful in communications, then your ability to learn from mistakes, your ability to understand what went wrong and change it and learn about your environment and how to do better is fundamental to your future um, uh, success. Now, in terms of the future of communication, which is the subject of this uh, talk, I would like to discuss uh, three things, and they are strategy, science and standards, which alongside uh, leadership, I think, make up the framework, the ground for whether we will succeed or fail as a profession in the future. But first I want to set uh, the context and then talk about how we might go about being um, uh, successful. So you are clear, and just to build on what Eleanor said about um, uh, my role, fundamentally I think I do three things as Director of the Government Communications uh, Service. Strategy, leadership and professional development. My role in um, uh, strategy is set out in the Government Communications Plan, which was um, uh, referenced, and that is a single plan for government. 144 campaigns encompassing expenditure of £500 million. Uh, pounds. My second task is to lead the combined Prime Minister's Office and Cabinet Office communications uh, team. Around 160 staff working in national security, the Prime Minister's press office and other functions. And my third role is to be, as head of professional um, uh, development, as head of profession for government communications, my job is to make my colleagues, and to some extent to make you more intelligent and richer than you currently are. Is this possible? Not sure. We have leadership, we have hospitality, we have a marvellous country. Perhaps there's a little lack of ambition in the room. But, you know, literally the story of creating the Government Communication Service goes back to um, 2010, when the coalition government came into power in the UK. At the time, we spent a billion pounds on government communications. A lot of money. And when the new government came in, um, and this is like a new client, a new chief executive, in this case, new prime minister, uh, the prime minister asked, not unreasonably, my predecessors, what benefit, what public benefit do I get from one billion pounds of expenditure? And my predecessors said, we don't know, but there's lots of it. <laughs> we've got 1,800 websites, we've got 400 logos, we've got 200 campaigns, we cover lots of ground. And in the aftermath of the financial crisis, at a time of austerity, the Prime Minister and Minister said, well, that's very interesting. But if you cannot measure your value, then you cannot prove your worth, and we're going to have to cut it in half to meet our budget requirements. So 2,700 government communicators lost their jobs because they couldn't prove their value. So when we created the Government Communications Service in 2013, I was absolutely obsessive about the need to demonstrate our value. We do that through our core operating model, which is described as OASIS. For every of those 144 campaigns, we say, what is the objective? Not how much media coverage or where would you like to be photographed, but what is the behavioural change you want us to deliver through this work? Who are the audience? An audience of uh, communication professionals in Lithuania is different from an audience of young Asian entrepreneurs in Leicester in the UK is different again to a group of uh, Lithuanians in that famous Lithuanian city, Peterborough, England, <laughs> which your president referenced, um, and we're very grateful for that, in his presidential address. They have different needs, expectations, backgrounds, they read and watch different media. But unless you can walk in the audience's shoes, how can you presume to communicate with them? An oasis, objective, 
audience, then the strategy, the ends, ways and means, and then the implementation, and finally the scoring, are the model for government communications in the UK. And that is how you run effective uh, campaigns. And getting that right, and the scoring, and the evaluation, the outputs, outtakes, outcomes, has been central to our um, uh, success uh, to, to date. So that is part of the story of the government communications and my role in terms of my obsession with working out what works, government comms strategy, operations and running the Prime Minister's office communications, but then that professional role about learning what works and enabling people to be brighter because they know more about their work and become uh, better off, become richer, because they go on and get more jobs because they're better prepared and more able to take on more complex um, uh, tasks. So let me turn then to the central part of this uh, speech. I read in the um, uh, FT uh, recently an interview with the president of Armenia, a man who has seen, as many of you in this room have seen, uh, great uh, change. And he said that we are moving from an era of classical politics to one of quantum uh, politics, by which he means the old politics where people were in tribes, the communist tribe, the liberal tribe, the conservative tribe, or whatever uh, it, it was, we're moving to an era where those labels are no longer true. You can see this to some extent, the political movements in Germany, in the United Kingdom, in America, the growth of populism across the continent, and so on. But more than that, he made the point that quantum politics is actually a reference to the fact that everyone is now potentially an editor or publisher, and certainly everyone is a commentator. And I've seen in the way that um, Twitter storms and um, uh, Facebook flash mobs can influence public policy and certainly broadcast output in the UK how this is true. So this is one of the defining moments of our age about how connected individuals can produce an effect by expressing their opinion on social uh, media. There's a positive side to this. The people can have their voices heard and the people who were, pre who were previously voiceless can speak. There's also a dark side to this new uh, technology. The fire hose of falsehood and the sewer of disinformation that sometimes drives um, uh, the international discussion, where rogue states, criminals, extremists, and peddlers of conspiracy theorists can try and pervert open, fact-based, credible, democratic, dem democratic debate. And those are some of the challenges which frame um, uh, the way we have to communicate today and in um, uh, the, the, the future. And particularly, this is true given the way society is changing. But before I talk about my practical way of addressing that, science and strategy and standards, I want to have a word about us as communicators. And this is not particularly directed at Lithuanian communicators, but it is, as speaking as someone who has built two communication um, uh, consultancies, uh, run three um, uh, major communication uh, teams, I think we sometimes need to reflect on our own brand and how we are perceived. And I think this is important because the area in which we work, we should be reassured and heartened by, is an area of growth and expansion. My father was a printer and he learned his trade on hot metal printers that bashed out um, uh, printing and his firm was destroyed by the growth of desktop publishing. But communications is a growing industry. And a recent report by the Reputation Institute pointed out it's worth 20% or more of the value of many major companies. I know in public service, our authority as a government depends on our ability to communicate coherently and consistently and reassure people and offer them choices and where it's necessary in areas like um, uh, public health, change behaviour for public good. So this is an area of growth and it's interesting to me that some of the big consultancy companies, the people who used to just do accountancy like Deloitte and KPMG are now moving into communication consultancy because they can see the value of this area. But when we look in the mirror, 
and think about how our clients or principals um, perceive us. We would like them to see us as strategic and creative and evidence-based and professional. We'd obviously also like them to believe that we're overworked and dedicated to their cause. And much of the time, our clients or principals may see us like that. But sometimes they will see what we do as poor performing, tactical, intuitive, crafting rather than strategic, potentially over remunerated and difficult to evaluate. And that distinction between how any brand and how the brand of communicators wants to be perceived and how we perhaps in certain, sense, uh, certain circumstances are perceived is a challenge I think we need to meet to raise standards and close this expectation gap. In my view, the gap is caused by inconsistent leadership, lack of evaluation, an absence of professional development and the failure to grasp the opportunities of new technology. I'm always surprised that when uh, we created Oasis, um, uh, people from NATO and the United Nations and the European Union, bodies that we've worked uh, with, latched onto it and said, this is a, a really good idea. Um, to me, it's just good practice. You think about your objectives and your audience. But it's also surprised me for a long time that uh, communications is done in a thousand different ways. And as I've gone round the world from Africa to Asia to Europe, you can find a hundred different templates for organising campaigns. You'd be a bit worried if your car mechanic or your accountant did the numbers or engineering in a hundred different ways. So why should we have this multiplicity of approaches for communications? So I want to talk briefly about how we meet that challenge of changing societies, of quantum politics, of differing perceptions of our communications. And I want to talk first about strategy. And strategy and stratcoms is one of those hugely overworked words that usually ends up becoming a cliche or worse still, shorthand. I'm fortunate in the UK um, uh, national security uh, meetings to sit next to the chief of the general staff, Sir Nick Carter. Carter's interesting as a soldier because he, in a lecture recently, said, look, we are effectively at war with Russia. It's a hybrid war, it's an information war, but it is a form of conflict, which I think was a brave and necessary thing to say. Nick Carter is a former honorary commandant of 77 Brigade, which is the British Army's unit which um, uh, is involved in information warfare. And it's interesting the growth of that unit into a divisional structure which is emblematic of where the military in the UK, in NATO and across the world are going. And Nick Carter has um, uh, led this. But talking to Nick about strategy, he said, look, strategy is misunderstood and strategy comes down to ends, ways and means and 90% of strategies fail because the desired goal, the ends, the things that your clients and chief executives and ministers ask you to achieve are not matched by the means. There's too little resource to deliver the ends, the goals that you require. And I think that's an important shorthand definition of strategy. And I can give you a longer one. In communication terms, strategy is bringing all the resources at your disposal in an integrated way to bear on a defined audience over time for a specific goal. But certainly my observation is the discipline of doing that and bringing all the resources to bear and break, breaking down silos within organisations and between teams and departments and bringing digital and media and marketing to bear at the same time seems more difficult to deliver than it sometimes is. So my, after better leadership, my ask of communicators is to develop strategy and understand how that can deliver for you and until you've had that proper strategic argument and thought very carefully about what you want to deliver then don't end up going down um, uh, the course of action. 
500 million pounds, which is the overall budget of the government communication service, is a lot of money. Actually, in terms of the overall expenditure of the UK government, it's fairly small, but it nevertheless demonstrates the value that government places on communications in order that it has the means to deliver the ends. The second point I want to make is about science. Science um, uh, is essential to the future of communications, data science, behavioural science, and the science of statistics. Behavioural science is something that I hope runs through all our uh, campaigns. To nudge people to the right decision, sometimes to shove them. It's good to say it's great if you eat five fruit or vegetables a day and encourage people to do that through price incentives or other mechanisms. Sometimes you have to shove people, pay your taxes on time or else. And we have a shorthand for behavioural science, which we use in planning our campaigns and getting our communicators to understand what is necessary, where we say for every communications intervention, just think, capability, opportunity and motivation equals behaviour change. If someone has the capability to change, the opportunity to do so and the motivation, they will respond to your communication. Otherwise, um, uh, they won't uh, change. Similarly, data science um, is hugely important to today's uh, communications. I am reputedly responsible for 9 billion social media impressions a year, all GDPR uh, compliant, but understanding how we use the data that flows in from our data sources is absolutely um, uh, critical. And certainly in the seven years I've been involved with government communications, we have moved from issuing to ministers and uh, senior officials piles of press releases to one-page um, written dashboard setting out um, uh, media sentiment and um, uh, public opinion to mobile dashboards on the wall that flash up what Twitter and Facebook are saying and the data feeds that Brandwatch and Ripjar and all these um, uh, very clever technologies can bring into our office in real time. One of the biggest changes I've seen working between working in the Prime Minister's office up to 1997 and then in the 21st century is the speed and volume of material that people have to deal with. And unless you've got good data to respond to that, then you can't stand a chance of winning and functioning in a new communications age. And finally, um, uh, and bringing that together, um, uh, standards. Um, uh, and alongside that, your commitment to your um, uh, own um, uh, professional uh, development. Um, the Government Communication Service in the UK has been going for 100 and uh, two years, so slightly older than the National uh, Library. And over that time, it's been built up, closed down, it's been through war and peace, it's run brilliant campaigns and um, failed campaigns. And we never stop learning. But it struck me that after 102 years, it was time to bring together the body of knowledge of uh, government communications, which we've recently published in a standard which sets out how we approach our work, coordinated, collaborative campaign communications that ignores boundaries like called public relations and marketing or stakeholder and says we have a holistic, integrated approach to what we do. It sets out the standards expected of leaders, the standards required of our evaluation and what we need each part of the organisation to do. It's linked very closely to our career uh, frameworks. It sets out how people can be the best professionals that they can be. But it's fine for me as the um, uh, head of the service to write this um, uh, uh, down, but I've realised that as we have done this, the thing I have to spend time and effort in is encouraging, cajoling and sometimes forcing people as communication, technology and society continues to change to invest in their uh, professional development. And we have very clear rules in place that unless people can, can complete and demonstrate their, their professional development, particularly in the areas of digital, leadership and evaluation, they are not eligible for um, our promotion. And as we've invested in this um, professional development and as we have surveyed how 
people have used more professional development, reported on that progress, and we've also surveyed people about their skills, we have noted, unsurprisingly, a correlation. The reported level of skills amongst our government communicators has increased. The reported completion and success rate for our, campaign, for our campaigns has improved. There is not necessarily a direct correlation between the two, but it would seem silly to ignore that statistical link between increased professional development and improved uh, campaign uh, outcome. I will finish by focusing on uh, one uh, particular area, which is um, uh, countering um, uh, modern slavery, um, a problem of our age. People transported uh, from around the world to various developed uh, countries, particularly an issue in the UK, to work without pay in farms, uh, in uh, factories. And we were asked by um, uh, colleagues in our interior ministry whether we could help design a campaign to uh, tackle this. It seemed like a difficult problem. How could you talk to people who were living in a state of slavery, who weren't allowed their mobile phones, who were kept away from uh, media and were literally slaves of a uh, boss and being exploited for their economic um, uh, worth? And what we did was to talk to communities, talk to people they might interact with, from doctors and in job centres and in cafes and restaurants, and say... Look out for the signs of modern slavery. Look out for people who look frightened or scared or being accompanied by someone who is probably not their friend or relative and please report it and we will act on it. Now this is important because this is an example of a campaign. Fundamentally I believe that government communications is there to save, improve and enhance people's lives. And this is precisely what this campaign did. This campaign works across the whole of the public service it works across the private and public um, uh, sectors, and it demands behavioural change. It demands people to look out for the signs of modern slavery. And over the past year, we have found that the independent evaluation of this campaign shows that up to 150 cases of modern slavery have been reported to the authorities. Perhaps 50 of those have resulted in people being taken out of conditions that none of us in this room would like to um, uh, live in, and the benefit in terms of releasing the economic potential of those uh, people, I'm told, amounts to over £50 million. So I hope that is an example of what great public service communications can do. I could talk about our public health work. I could talk about the work we do to recruit teachers and nurses and other public service workers. I could talk about our trade work or our work to counter terrorism. But I think that example about evaluated cross-public service work for public good is a good one to demonstrate some of the things that I have talked about today. So, in summary... Inspiring leadership, rigorous strategy, data and scientific driven interventions and stronger professional development, I think, I think are the things that will guide you in your careers and will ensure and safeguard your career in the future. But that's all very well. I think the final thing I would um, uh, focus on is when I was talking to our Deputy National Security Advisor about what she wanted from government communications, she said that she wanted brave, bold and confident communicators. And that speaks both to leadership and to the confidence you get from having the best professional development. And I think that is a good call to action for communicators in London and Vilnius. Thank you very much for listening.